We bless your name, Lord, for your goodness, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Lord, because we have come together not to worship ourselves, but to worship you. And Lord, we pray you speak your word to every heart at this time in Jesus' name. Glorify yourself, Lord. Lift up the name of Jesus and then let us understand your gospel. Help us, Lord, to respond to that gospel. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the age, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. You notice what the Lord Jesus Christ was impressing upon the church, upon the believers, upon his disciples, just before he went to the cross, before he paid that great price for salvation and redemption. He told them he had come for the first time. He'll be going away to heaven, and then he'll be coming the second time. Before he came, before he'll come for the second time. Something will happen. It says there will be many false prophets. And they shall deceive many. And it says because iniquity just by the time Christ will come. Because iniquity will abound. Iniquity and sin and transgression and evil doing will totally increase. It says many people will have their love. Their devotion, their commitment, their yieldedness, their relationship to the Lord, they'll slow down on all those things. He said, the love of many shall wax cold. But he says, there'll be those who will endure to the edge. And only those who endure to the edge, those people shall be saved. Then he said, in the midst of it all, were the rumors of war. And with all the suffering of war, with the beginning of sorrows, and all the sufferings that will come upon the world, with the love of many waxing cold, and with many false prophets rising, there is something that must continue. And it is the preaching of the gospel. It says, this gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, must be preached. In all the world, and then the end will come. In Mark chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 10. Mark 13, verse 10. And the gospel must first be preached among all nations. Now you notice the word there, the gospel. Referring back to the same gospel. The unaltering gospel, the unchanging gospel. It says that gospel, the same gospel that Jesus Christ preached, and the same gospel he gave to his own disciples. And then those disciples have given that to us. It says that same gospel will keep on preaching that gospel until the end comes. And it says, as we go from nation to nation, from city to city, from age to age, from generation to generation, from, from one period to another period of time. It says there must be no alteration, there must be no change, there must be no adulteration. It must be this same gospel being preached everywhere in all the world, among all nations. Before the end of the world is giving us a commission, an unchanging commission, a glorious commission, 
and we continue in that commission preaching that gospel until the end shall come. Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 14, I am dead of both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, and to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Here Paul the apostle who has come to know the Lord. After Jesus went up unto heaven, and the Lord gave him that same commission, and the same commission is given to you and given to me. And here Paul the apostle says, because of that commission, I'm a debtor to the Greeks, those who are wise, those who are educated, those who are the elites, those on top in society, and then to the barbarians, to the illiterates, to the people that are low. What debt do you owe, Paul? And what debt do we owe? We are Christians today. What debt do we owe our people? That's the debt of preaching the gospel, making them to know the way, the way of life, the way of salvation, the way to life eternal. And so it says, I pay my debt in verse 15, as much as in me is, as long as God gives me the stress, as long as God gives me this life, as long as I breathe this free air and I receive this free grace from the Lord, as much as in me is. It says in that verse 15, I'm ready, I'm willing, whatever it will take. I'm willing to do whatever I need to do. And I'm ready to go wherever I need to go. I'm ready to get myself exercised and put my neck under the yoke. That's what he meant. He knew when he went to Rome, he might see some challenges and some difficulties. He might even go through some persecution as he did in Iconium, in Antioch, in Athens, in all those places. He said, whatever be the case, as long as God gives me the grace and the light, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that at Rome also. Then he says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and then also to the Greeks. That's the challenge you are talking about today. Commitment to preaching Christ's unchanging gospel. Commitment to preaching Christ's unchanging gospel. It's a gospel. It's a good news. It's a glad tidings. But that gospel, as it has good news for us, and it has some benefits that we are going to receive. It has some conditions. And those conditions are unchanging. And the benefits of the gospel are unchanging. So also, the condition of entering into that benefit of the gospel, the conditions are unchanging. And then it's giving us the commission. And our life, every day, every moment, is to be so committed to the preaching of that unchanging gospel. Commitment to preaching Christ's unchanging gospel. Three points we're going to consider. Number one, our commission. Number one, our commission. Number two, his commandment. His commandment. Number three, our commitment. Commission, commandment, commitment. Number one, 
our commission to preach the gospel. Our commission to preach the gospel. Number two is commandment to preserve the gospel. Don't change it. Don't modify it. Keep it as you got it. His commandment to preserve the gospel. Number three, a commitment to preach the gospel. A commitment to preach the gospel. Number one, our commission to preach the gospel. The Lord has given us a commission. And that commission is to preach this good news to the world. This glad tidings to reveal the way of salvation to the people who are not saved. In Mark chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He told those few disciples. And those few disciples were representative of all the disciples from that time until the end of the age. Until the end of the world. And he told them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He told them, number one, the first verb there, go. And verb, then that gives you a commission. That, that gives you an assignment. That gives you a responsibility, a duty, something to do. And he says, go. If you are staying, you are disobedient. If you are sitting, you are disobedient. If you are idle, you are disobedient. If you are doing nothing, you are disobedient. He said, go. And then when you go, he tells you where to go. All the world. From this place to that place. From this nation to that nation. From this group of people to that group of people. From this language to that language. Go into all the world. And then when you go there, you're not going there to entertain them. Be, are you? And you're not going there to just mix up with them or to enjoy life with them or to do any other thing. You're going there to do one thing proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Go and preach the gospel. And then when you go there, you'll not just uh, avoid some and then associate with others. You go into all the world and you preach the gospel to every creature. Now it tells us ahead of time, some will believe, some will doubt, some will accept, and some will reject. And then it says, but no this, for those who accept, they are baptized in their identification with the Lord our Savior. To those who reject, they are not baptized as an evidence to them. They have nothing to do with Christ. In verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. He that believeth will be baptized. You preach the gospel. They lay aside their own ideology, their own religion, their own past lives, and they accept the truth of the good news, the, the glad tidings, the gospel. He that believes, accepting the totality of the gospel revealed unto them, they be baptized in water so that you show their death with Christ. Their resurrection with Christ. And then those who do not believe, believe they will be lost. Mark chapter 1. Here we find what the gospel really is. As Christ preached it. Mark chapter 1. 
I'm reading from verse 14. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. That's what he said. We shall preach what he preached. The gospel. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world until the end shall come. He preached that gospel. What are the elements of that gospel? Look at verse 15. In verse 15, saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Here are the elements of the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. One aspect is that the sinner looks at his life and he sees that his sins are odious to the Lord. His sin makes him ugly in the sight of the Lord. His sin makes him unacceptable in the sight of the Lord. Therefore, he turns away from sin. He repents of sin. He gets to reach of sin. He quits his sin. And then he turns to the Lord and he believes the gospel. That's, that's what we're to preach. You go into all the world. Where you find yourself. You preach that gospel. In Luke chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 44. And he said unto them. These are the words which I spake unto you. While I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled. That were written in the law of Moses. And in the prophets. And in the Psalms. Concerning me. Then opened he their understanding. That they might understand the scriptures. And then it were told. And said unto them. Thus it is written. And thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. The third day was not telling them the necessary death of Christ. And the following resurrection of Christ. That now as you go to preach the gospel, you arch the death, the suffering, the agony, the substitution. Because he became our substitute, he carried the load of our sin. The condemnation for our sin, that's what he carried. And you must tell them. But tell them that Satan will not have the victory. And tell them that Christ rose from the dead. And then, as they're going to be partakers of the benefits of the gospel, you tell them something they must do. Remember now the two elements, repent and believe ye the gospel. Verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins shall be preached in his name among all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. You will tell them there must be repentance. Repentance, and that repentance will be, will be preached in all nations. And you begin right there at Jerusalem. Do you see how those people obeyed Christ? And that's what he wants us to do today, to obey him. How did they preach Acts chapter 2? Preaching the gospel. I remember what he told them, he said, you'll begin that preaching in Jerusalem. And the emphasis of that, pre of that preaching will be repentance, turning away from sin, coming to the Lord, receiving Christ as your personal Savior, telling them, showing them, revealing unto them that to be saved, but be willing to get out of sin, out of transgression, out of evil doing, out of iniquity. We must be willing to surrender every evil thing in our hand. Surrender to the Lord and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That that is the way that leads to salvation in Christ. He said, preach that in all nations beginning at Jerusalem. 
Look at Jerusalem now, how they preach. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And you'll notice something there. The people have come from all over the nations. And Jesus said, preach. The same gospel in all the nations of the world. Before they even had the opportunity to go to all the nations of the world, the nations of the world, the representatives, the Jews who were there, they came unto them. And as they came unto them, they came to Jerusalem. And that's why that's what Jesus said, they must begin. And remember what he said, they must begin preaching. They must begin preaching repentance. Turning away from sin. Turning away from that sin that made Jesus to go to the cross to die. And then we're told they were in Jerusalem. Look at the conclusion of the preaching. Now verse 37. Now, when they had heard this, they were preached in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They wanted to know. We feel guilty. We crucified Christ. We feel guilty that we supported our leaders in nailing Christ to the cross. We are definitely guilty of the blood of Christ. Now, is there any remedy? Is there any solution? What shall we do? Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Do you see that? Are those apostles and disciples, how they obeyed the Lord Jesus Christ, as they told them, Preach repentance everywhere you go. Now I'm going to remind you again. This takes the power of the Holy Ghost. Because you know these apostles and uh, these believers when Christ was crucified. They were hiding. They were fearful. They were timid. And they were hiding behind closed doors. They caught our master. I don't want them to catch me. They put a son, a crown of thorns upon a master's head. I don't want them to do that to me. And they cruelly crucified our Lord. And they slew him in, in a terrible way. I don't want them to do that to me. Because of that, they were hiding. But then on the day of Pentecost, Holy Ghost came upon them. Well, the Holy Ghost came power. Anointing, boldness, authority, fearlessness That they knew now that the Pharisees were all their evil deeds They were not to be the master But Christ was still to be the master Therefore they came out And they opened their mouths and they preached The gospel of salvation The demand of repentance The necessity of faith in Christ until the people said, men and brethren, we recognize our guilt. We recognize the evil that we have done. Just tell us the solution, the remedy, the redemption. And they said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the removal, remission, forgiveness of your sins. And then it says, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you know that those disciples, they never got away from that obedience. What to preach? The unchanging gospel. The unalterable gospel. The unbending gospel. The uncompromised gospel. Repentance and faith in Christ. Let's look at Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Still that same word. And the Lord has called you, has called me, has called all of us together to preach the gospel. And the very first element of that gospel is for the people to realize 
that we have seen. All have seen and come short of the glory of God. And that it is repentance, turning away from sin. That is the very first step we take in our approaching the Lord and going in the direction of the Lord. And then when you get to the Lord, after repentance, you believe, you accept, you receive what he did for you on the cross of Calvary. And here again is the message. Repent, repent ye therefore, and be converted. Conversion means a change, a transformation. You are in darkness before, let there be a change and come to the light. You are in sin before, let there be a change to righteousness. You are in evil before, let there be a change and come to the goodness of the Lord. Repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Repent, turn, so that your sins will be blotted out. What does that mean? It means when you turn away from sin, the Lord will know you are interested in salvation. When you turn away from sin, the Lord will know you are interested in restoration. And you know the people of the world. And then you find even some people in the church, I don't mean this church, I mean church at large. They say grace covers each all. And you give the impression to the sinners, the greater your sins, the greater the grace. That when you sin and sin and sin, then God will manifest grace plus grace plus grace. They even now teach those who are believers, those who say they are believers, they teach them that. They don't teach the believers to run away from sin, to keep away from sin. They say you are saved, you are forever saved. And the grace of God is always there. They say the more you sin, the more the love of God will be manifested. And they encourage believers to continue in their sin. But the question is, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the answer in the Bible? God forbid that you repent, you turn away from sin. You are converted so that your sins will be blotted out. And the time of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. I pray it will come to every one of us. Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And in Bostachi, and the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. But now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. It says, this is the commandment of the Lord. And this is the gospel where to go to declare to the people. Are you preaching on the bus? Talk about repentance. Are you preaching to your neighbors? Talk about repentance. Are you preaching to your child? To your wards? To your mates? Preach repentance. Are you talking to your schoolmates? Talk about repentance. Are you talking to your friends? A co worker? Are you trying to win souls in the public? over the pulpit or to that individual as a person repentance he has commanded all men everywhere to repent are you talking to a backslider to the one that said i was there before but i didn't like everything going on so i left and you want them to get to heaven you don't want them to die in a backsliding stage when you're talking to them how do you tell them to have restoration into the grace of God, into the bosom of the Lord, into fellowship with the Almighty God? Repentance. You tell them, repent. And be converted. Every one of you. Because this is what he has commanded. He now commands every man, all men, everywhere to repent. In the such a one. Because he has appointed a day. In the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men 
again that he has raised him from the dead. Acts chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 20. Acts chapter 20 verse 20. And now I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you. But I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. That's what you're talking about. Preaching the gospel publicly. And preaching the gospel from house to house. To individuals. From person to person. What was he preaching? Verse 21. Testifying both to the Jews. And also to the Greeks. Number one. Repentance toward God. That's the gospel. The very first element in preaching the gospel in declaring the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is repentance. Repentance toward God and the second element in that verse 21 and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a commission. It tells us in Luke chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 59. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. I have my personal agenda. I have my private agenda. I have my priority in life. I want to go first and bury my father. This man was not putting Christ first, he wasn't putting God first. He wasn't putting the kingdom of God first. He put himself first. And that's the problem of many people. Sell. Selfish consideration. Personal consideration. The individual sin. I want to do. My in life. My personal sin that must be done before I ever consider any other thing. That's the problem. See what Jesus said in verse 60. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. And there are some things the people who are dead in sin, the people of the world, there are some things they can do well. Let them do that. But there's something they cannot do. That is the preaching of the gospel. Let them do what they can do well. And they let bury their dead. But you do what they cannot do. But you go preach the kingdom of God. That's a commission. We're going to carry it out. Everywhere we go. Telling the lost. Of the Savior who died for them. Telling sinners how they can come to the Lord. How they can be saved. That we must do that we're going to do. I said we're going to do it. I come to point number two. is a commandment to preserve. To preserve the gospel. The commandment to preserve the gospel. As we take the gospel from village to village. From town to town. From city to city. From nation to nation, all over the world, you'll meet challenges. You'll meet difficulties. You know something? Difficulties change men. Difficulties change people. Rough roads change travelers. If you've been a traveler, you know that. You started the journey. And you said, I'm going to get there at record time. I'm going to maintain this speech. I'm going to focus in this direction. You didn't know the road. Now you got on the road. And then the road is up, down, up, down, here and there, rocky and mountainous. And you say, looks like I need to change my speed. Difficulties change men. Not only I just gave you that as illustration, the because change people, teachers, you get to a school, and before you go to school, you had some ideas in your brain, in your mind, 
I'm going to get those students to work. They will do assignment. They will do this. They will do that. I'm going to teach in this way. My friend, difficulties change men. And then you get to class. And the children, they say, ah, are you going to teach encyclopedia in one month? This is too much. Slow down. And then you refuse to slow down. And then they refuse to do assignment. And no matter what you do, they just do whatever. And that teacher will change. I'm telling you, difficulties change men. Here comes a politician. And the politician says, we're going to right every wrong. And we're going to erase every corruption. In this, our country, by the time I finish my term, there will be no corruption left. And then you raise up this, and raise up this, and raise up this. And then you come against roadblocks and difficulties, indescribable challenges. And before his term runs over, he says, this uh, corruption has a kind of demon ahead. It is a dragon. And then I want to save my life. I leave all that. Difficulties change men. Now Jesus said, disciples, you'll meet a lot of challenges. Persecution, pressure, conflict, beating, scourging, death. Don't you let difficulty or death, danger, whatever, don't let it change the gospel. You have a command to preserve. Preserve the gospel at the very cost of your life. That this gospel, you know what we're talking about? This is the only medicine that heals the disease of sin. When you adulterate the medicine, the people are going to die. And so, if doctors love the people they are ministering, all that medication to, whatever the cost, whatever the challenge, they must maintain the purity of the content of the medicine they give out. If they are interested in the people getting healed, if we are interested in people getting saved, in people getting to heaven, in people reconciling with Christ, in people reconciling with the Lord, in people making right their ways. There's no other gospel. Don't allow difficulties or dangers or even death to change you and change the gospel. Our commandment to preserve the gospel. Look at Matthew chapter 24 again. Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom, not another gospel, this gospel, this gospel of repentance and faith in Christ, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world by witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come until the very time of the end. Keep on preaching. This same gospel. Mark chapter 13 verse 10. Mark chapter 13 verse 10. Before I read verse 10, look at verse 9. And take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to the councils and in the synagogues. Ye shall be beaten. And ye shall be brought before the rulers and the kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. Before you go on, why don't you look up here for a moment? Thank you. And you, you know, if you're doing something, let's say, for example, a market women, you go to the market. When you get to the market, you say, I'm going to be the best trader and the richest seller in this community. And then the union people, the you know, association of whatever, market women, contributing to worship idol or whatever, they come and they gather all your things. You are not joining us, they gather your things, and then they take it away. Then you remember your goal, your decision. I'll be the best seller and the best trader in this community. You go to pack other things, you come there, they pack everything again, and they go. 
after they've done that for two, three weeks, you begin to change your goal, your plan, your project, your purpose. You begin to change your dream. I thought I'd be the best seller, the best trader in this community, but see what they have done. The first week, they said, because I was not just association, they carried all my things. And the second week, they came again. And the third week, they came again. And now they are not just carrying my things, they are becoming violent. They are even trying to assault me. And so you say, I say, can you look for another situation? That's right, that's what I'm telling you. Difficulties change people. That's what Jesus told them. He said, you know what? I'm going to tell you ahead of time. You're going to go through some challenges. Up, heal, task on my behalf. And he said, they will deliver you to the council. In the synagogue, you'll be beaten. And you shall be brought before the rulers and the kings for my sake. You know, if you have urged that consecration, I will preach. I will go everywhere. And you stand up in the bus. And then you stand up to preach. They push you here, they push you there. If you are not careful, the difficulties will change you. I think there are other things somebody can do. Apart from preaching on the bus, there you are. Difficulties will change people that don't have enough grace of God. Or maybe it is you want to you preach even in your locality. Our district this year must double. Come with me. We're going to do what it will take. And therefore, these three people, come on now. Let us go here. Let us go there. And there you pitch your tent there. You begin to have a district crusade. And while you're doing that, some people are throwing stones, throwing stones. And one of them landed on the pulpit. And didn't thank God. He didn't touch it. You look like that. While you're looking, another one comes again. Then you say, these three people, you know what? Uh, invite the people to come to church Invite them How about the crusade you spoke about Leader Well, you don't, did, were you not there last night? Difficulties change people That's why people change That's why they even change the message That's why they cannot talk about repentance again Because the difficulties they have the dangers they go through, the oppression, the persecution they go through will change them. It will not change you. Yeah. Where are the people that will stand up and emphasize the same thing all the apostles emphasize? Repentance unto God and faith unto the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why for the sake of the nation, for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of generations to come, you will not change. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, uh, when you're preaching the gospel, when you first start, there's a lot of excitement. I want to win souls. Keep that excitement going, that enthusiasm going, that fire burning, that unction upon your heart, upon your life. Whatever you see in the way. After all, you know, it's even easier today. See what they did to Paul the Apostle. And see what they did to all those apostles. Uh, by and large, nobody will do that today. Nobody is going to, you know, catch you and put you in prison. All they can do is, you know, maybe just snub you or neglect you or just overlook you. Deny you a literal sin here, literal sin. Uh, what's that? What's that? In comparison with the imprisonment that all those apostles went. And if they still remain faithful until the very end, the way I look at you, you'll be faithful to the very end. And then after that, after that verse 9, look at what he says in verse 10. And... The gospel must first be published among all nations. The same gospel. The same gospel. Repentance and faith in Christ. Preserve it. That's his commandment to preserve. To preserve the gospel. And let's look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In 2 Corinthians 11, I'm reading verses 3 and 4. But I fear less by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, through his subtlety, 
so that your, so your minds shall be corrupted from the simplicity that, you, that is in Christ. Here Paul the Apostle said, Corinthians, you know, I'm so much afraid of you. Not afraid as if they are going to hurt him. No, afraid as if they are going to abandon the gospel. Forsake the gospel. And live the simplicity that is in Christ. Then he said, For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus. He's saying, I've come to you, I've preached to you, I've told you about the real Jesus. The one who died, was buried three days, and rose again. And because of his resurrection, he's purchased eternal life for us. And he wants us to turn away from sin, receive him. And I'm not looking at it as I've left. Another preacher may come and preach another Jesus. In that verse 4, whom ye have not, whom we have not preached. Or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received. Or another gospel. Or another gospel. That's possible. Somebody else coming. He has faced the fire and the flame and the flood. And because of the torrential persecution that came upon him, he felt, if I don't change, these people are going to kill me prematurely. So he has changed. He valued his life above the light of the gospel. He exalted his security and safety above the salvation of the multitude. And he said, I'm going to preserve my life. I'm not going to go through all this fire and all this, all this stuff. I'm going to change and begin to preach another gospel. And when you think about it, those other people who changed because of difficulty. What have they seen that Paul had not seen? What have they gone through that Paul had not gone through? What have they endured that Paul had not endured? And yet Paul kept to the preaching of the gospel. And then he tells us in verse 13, For such are false apostles, those who preach another gospel. Those who are changed by difficulty. Those who modify the gospel because they don't want to suffer. It says those are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for even for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. You will not change the gospel. I said you will not adulterate the gospel. Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, I marvel that he has so soon removed from them that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Can you imagine? Even at the time of Paul the Apostle, as, as fiery as Paul was, at the time of Peter, James, John, and the rest of the apostles, as committed as they were, there were some other people that already mutilated, modified, changed, adulterated the gospel. I marvel that she has also removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another because there's no alternative. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Say perversion of the gospel. Now look up brothers and sisters. You know what our country has done? Our country has raised up a monitoring ministry. Monitoring the drugs, the medicine, the food, everything that comes to this country. And before, before anything will pass through the world that we're going to put in our mouth because of our health, because of our security, because of our life, it must go through that monitoring ministry. 
And then they say, no, that one is not acceptable. That one is not acceptable. And if anything comes to the, to the smallest biscuit, to the smallest metolito, and to the, to the smallest sin that you put in your mouth, that they say that sin has expired. And the sin has caused that individual billions of naira to bring everything in. And they say it's expired. Or they say it is fake. That this kind of drug should not be in our country. There is, you know, somebody there at the top. Yes, you know, the danger is there. And you know, the, those people, those who are traders, and those people that are ordering those things to come, when that a person there on top in that ministry, when he says, burn those things up, and he try to bribe him or bribe her, and she says, no, because that's going to kill, that's going to cause death, burn it up. And they burn it up. Now those people are not going to be happy. They've lost 90 million naira in porting that thing. Burn it up. They've spent 200 million naira in porting that thing. Burn it up. They're going to like her. And yet, after these years, she keeps stable there. And says, I don't care what they say. I'm going to protect the lives of the people. If they can do that faithfully to preserve what you consume, what comes to you, so you will not die. How about this God's peel gospel that comes to people if you pervert it, if you corrupt it, if you adulterate it, if you modify it, if the contents are no more complete, people are not going to be saved. Their lives are going to be in danger. That's the reason why you want to tell the Lord whatever difficulty or challenge and whatever danger or death, you want to preserve the purity and the completeness of that gospel. And do not allow a perverted gospel to come to a people. That's why it says, which is not another, but seven. But there will be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. Now verse 8. But though we, or angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you. See what Paul is saying. So strong about this. Though we, we preachers, we will be your leaders. Any of us that have preached unto you before. If because of the challenges we face today, because of the difficulties we're going through today, because of the opposition coming from the people in our community, if any of us will turn around and preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we are preaching to you, let him be a cause. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. In verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man, any man, any man, preach any other gospel unto you, than that ye have received, let him be a cause. Finally, amen. Yeah. You know, you know that's, that makes it so serious then. He wants us to remain preaching the gospel. You have some little difficulties. Why does God allow difficulties to come the way of preachers? So that he can give you a reward. If we suffer with him, we we'll reign with him. And the Lord could prevent those difficulties. He could prevent all those challenges. He could prevent all those persecution. He just trying to help us. So I'm reward when we get to heaven. That's why he allows all those things to come. Because if there is no difficulty and no challenge, your stamina will not be tested. Your commitment and courage will not be tested. It permits the test so that at last you will wear the crown. And you are going to wear the crown. I come to point number three now. Our commitment to preaching the gospel. Our commitment to preaching the gospel. John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 4. John 9, verse 4. I must work. I must work. Lord, 
They're trying to kill you. They're coming at you and want you to kill you. I must work. Lord, one of the disciples, his name is Judas Iscariot. He's ready trying to have a deal with the people that are going to catch you. I must work. And then, even when he was facing the cross, the challenges were still there. And the responsibility was still there. Even when he was on the cross, remember me when you come to your kingdom today, you'll be with me in paradise. I must work. The Lord is telling us then about our commitment in the face of danger. In the face of difficulty. In the face of opposition. In the face of persecution in your community. Now if you look at this church, this verse I've read now, I must work the work of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. And let your mind go back to 1977, 78, 79, 80. Look at them on the bus. Look at them on the streets. Look at them everywhere. Preaching, preaching. Announcing the good news. That gets people into the kingdom. Everybody. Member. Walker, even some people that were not born again, in their process of being born again, they were still sick with sin. But they got spill the gospel that will give them that spiritual hell. They are trying to take it and trying to repent. They are telling other people, You must repent, both believers and to be believers, preaching the gospel. But 30 years ago, 25 years ago, how about you today? What are we doing? Oh, I'm a house fellowship leader. Uh huh. That's just by the wayside. The real thing. Preach the gospel to every creature. I'm the work already. Uh huh. But that's just by the wayside. Jesus didn't trace up those workers. All he knew is everybody. He gave talents to everyone. And he said, Occupy until I come. Our work is out there where the people are, reaching out to them, touching their lives. What you do inside here, five minutes, ten minutes, you're through. What you do inside here? What you do inside here, 30 minutes, teach inside the scripture, and you're through. The real work, the real assignment, the real duty outside there. You know there are people that will defend what you're doing inside here. And when you think about it, what you do inside here is limited. We have a lot of dynamic preachers and dynamic coordinators, and only one coordinator can teach the scripture one Sunday. How about hundreds of the rest? No, they have to wait for another time. In fact, there are some coordinators, and this is it's not their fault, and it's not my fault, because we have how many combined services do you have in one year? It's less than 12. And when you think about our coordinators, we have more than almost, you know, in your group alone of services. How many do we have? Almost getting to 100. And how can we make use of 100 coordinators to teach the scripture on, one, on all the Sundays of the year? There are some coordinators for three years. It will not come to their turn. Is that any punishment? No. The real work is out there. Here we come to celebrate. Here we come to exalt Christ. Here we come to say, what have we done during the week? Here, this is not for work. This is not for responsibility. There, outside there, is the work that we do. And the same thing with the, the, same thing with the choir. Ten minutes and we're through. There's not much here. The real work is outside there. The same with the usher, security, everybody. The real work is outside there. And, and you know, sometimes with so much kind of diverted, divided, distracted, that on the ten minutes thing here, 
on the little thing here, we fight about that. And we're so unhappy about that, that the ten minutes we have not given because of that, all the hours of ministry outside were kind of not faithful to the Lord, unfaithful to the great commission. Things will change. And it will change for the better in Jesus' name. That's why it says, I must work. The works of him that sent me, while it is day, the night cometh when no man can walk, you will walk. And what the Lord did is passing across to you and to me. John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 14. I've given them thy word, and the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Get ready for that. As we go to preach the gospel, the world will hate you. When somebody hates you, does he smile? What do they do? They frown. And you see from the look, from the language, from everything you do, we hate you. We don't like you. And we go, if we have our chance, we're going to torment you. That's right. And yet, in the midst of that torment, in the midst of that challenge, go preach the gospel. And don't you ever say, Oh Lord, I cannot bear this again. I cannot go through this again. Therefore, if the world is going to be lost, that's their headache. Let them be lost. I want to avoid difficulty. He that loveth his life to save his life will lose that life. But he that loses his life for my sake and for the gospel's sake, he'll find it with life eternal. You have to look at danger in the face and then run towards that danger. Don't ever run away from danger, away from difficulty, away from persecution. In the midst of all the persecution, they are not of the world. And have chosen them out of the world. That's why the world has hated them. Run towards that. And those people that hate you, love them and give them the gospel. In verse 15, I pray not. That thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. You are not of the world. And we are not of the world. Then it says, sanctify them through thy truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now in verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. The Father sent him to the world so that the people in the world can be saved. And the Lord has sent us in the same way into the world that the people in the world might be saved. They will be saved. Amen. We're looking at John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Verse 20 and verse 21. And when he had so said, he showed them unto them his hands and his side. Then were well, the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, as my Father hath sent me, even so in that Verse 21, send I you. Will you go? And will you do what he has told you to do? Yes, we will. And the Lord will bless our service, our work in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also. He said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, not only apostles, not only pastors, not only the pulpit preachers, whosoever, every Christian, every believer, 
everyone that wants to get to heaven, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. You're trying to protect your life, protect your dignity, protect your personality, protect whatever it is. You don't tell anybody to, you know, I know my age, I know my dignity, I know my status in society, I know who I am, I even know my kind of membership in the church. I don't, because of, you know, preaching, serving the Lord, evangelizing, talking to people, I don't want anybody to drag my dignity, my honor, my name to the ground. There you are. You cannot lose something like that. The honor, the glory of this world, the respect of the world. You cannot lose that for the sake of the Lord. In verse 35, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake. And the gospels, the same shall save it. You lose the life, throw it, throw it to Jesus. Don't worry about it anymore. Your reputation, the praise of men. The honor, the respect, whatever it is, throw it into the hands of Jesus. Just, just forget about that. And then now you say, Lord, for the rest of my life, no matter how many years remain, all I'm going to do is just to preach the unchanging, unadulterated gospel. It says, this when you throw your life, you're not throwing it away. When you throw something to Jesus, a good goalkeeper, he'll catch it. And he'll keep it. Because he says I'm persuaded. That what I've committed into a sign. Is able to keep until that day. For what shall he profit a man. If he shall gain the whole world. And lose his own soul. Or what shall he, what shall a man. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul. Whosoever therefore. Shall be ashamed of me. And of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Are you ashamed of the Lord and the boss? Ashamed of the Lord in your community? Ashamed of the Lord in your family? Ashamed of the Lord in your place of work. You cannot even declare you are a Christian. And you cannot tell other people to come to Christ. You don't even want them to know that you are a believer. Why? You are ashamed of identifying with Christ in the public. And he says, I'll be ashamed of you when I come in the glory of my Father. I pray that God will grant us total repentance and total restoration. No more shame. No more fear of man. What he has told us to do, we will do. I said we will do. Acts chapter 8 verse 4. Acts chapter 8. We're reading from verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. We we'll soon live here. We don't live here. We came to worship. We came to celebrate. We came to pray. We came to hear what's the mind of the Lord for the coming week, for the coming months, and for the coming years of our lives. And now we've come together to celebrate and to worship. And then we scatter abroad to all our communities. And they that were scattered abroad went everywhere. Do you what? That's what we're going to do now. Why don't you rise up and make a commitment of your life to the Lord. They scattered abroad, went everywhere, preaching the word. No more ashamed of Christ. No more ashamed of the gospel. No more ashamed of our responsibility. They went abroad, everywhere, preaching the word. Make a commitment of your life to the Lord. You will preach this gospel. 